I think oftentimes a lot of things could be healed if we would just start moving more and not at a certain time and not in a certain place and not in a certain way with rules, but just like move. And I know for me, I see it in my life so clearly. Welcome to Once Upon a Playtime, a podcast from the genius of play for parents and their kids about the serious importance of having fun. Today's story is The Dancer Who Loved Long Division, a true tale about how play helps us find our passions, whatever they may be. My name is Stephanie Clemens, and I am a Broadway performer, choreographer, and director. I'm a mom of two boys, and I am also the founder of a nonprofit organization called Katie's Art Project. Stephanie has danced her way through some of Broadway's biggest hits. As a performer, dance captain, and choreographer, she's worked on musicals like In the Heights, If Then, and Bring It On. Oh, and she also did this other show, It's kind of underground. My most notable show that many people have heard of is Hamilton. I was an original cast member, and I'm also the associate choreographer of that show. That's right, Hamilton, the 11-time Tony Award-winning, record-breaking, international musical phenomenon, Hamilton. Stephanie has worked with Hamilton for nearly seven years. You might think that working with the same musical for that long could get boring, but not for Stephanie. You know, it's interesting at this point in my life when I'm in the position where I am like managing Hamilton and I'm doing the same kind of dance over and over again, right? Like how many times have I run an audition to the song My Shot? But even just the release of doing the same movement is something for me. And I can tell in my body and my life when I don't get to do it and it's never good. For Stephanie, and for a lot of other people, dance doesn't just help her body. Dancing, like all forms of active play, helps us develop coordination, balance, and motor skills. But it also helps us process our emotions. Yeah, so if I could explain the feeling for me when I'm not dancing or when I haven't danced for a while, it's kind of like the feeling of being stuck in a very small box. Like, I begin to feel walls and it's not just like in my body i almost always see the pattern first in my emotional well-being and health stephanie's journey towards hamilton might surprise you how does a brainy genius girl with a store of knowledge who study astrophysics in college learn and form you was and solve an x to find the answer leave all that behind and become a famous broadway dancer you know what that was awkward Let's begin again in five, six, five, six, seven, eight. Once upon a time, in a not so far away kingdom called New Jersey, there was a little girl named Stephanie. And like lots of little kids, Stephanie loved to play. One of her favorite ways to play was to move. Yeah, so movement entered my life very early on via MTV music videos. And, you know, when Madonna would release a new music video, it was like the most exciting thing that I would wait for all week. But as Laura goes, at two years old, I saw a Madonna music video and I learned every dance step and I could dance with the TV. Now, I don't know if my mom's memory is just like me shaking it and she thought, oh, that's good. Or if I actually learned the steps. But I did actually start dancing early. And while two-year-old Stephanie was voguing, she found her passion. Finding your passion can take years or even decades. Some people never find their passion at all. But by the age of two, Stephanie had stumbled upon her one true passion, dance. Five, six, seven, wait, I take that back. Dancing was Stephanie's passion, but it wasn't her only passion. There was another way she liked to play. And I liked kind of playing on my own and my favorite thing to do was like math games. My favorite game as a kid was long division. (laughs) I would make my mom write like these like really ridiculously long numbers and do like old school, you know, division. So I would ask her to write like 20 number long numbers or like, you know, something that would just take me a really long time. And basically that was my very favorite thing to do. 
Each morning, Stephanie would ask her mother to write a long division problem on her dry erase board. It was her favorite way to play. Now you might be thinking, hey, math can't be play, but you'd be wrong. Play can be dolls and blocks and board games, and those things are lots of fun. But play can also be vacuum cleaners and tinfoil and yes, even math on dry erase boards. To me, play is the ability to do anything, structured or not, math games, division, or run in circles, you know, whatever play is for you. And at the end of playtime, you don't have to hand in a paper to be graded. There is no necessary outcome. It's just purely discovery. Play comes in many shapes and sizes, but the common denominator is discovery. And Stephanie got to play and discover on her own terms because she had an awesome and supportive mom. My mom was really an integral part of my childhood and exploring what I like to do and how I like to play. Even though she did work a lot, she would give me those long division problems or I used to love putting on like press on nails. That was like, so she would just, you know, buy me like one pack of press on nails every day. And, you know, so whatever it was that I enjoyed doing, she was always in support of me exploring that and giving me the opportunity to have access to the things that I wanted to do. Whether it's dance, long division, or press on nails, a play routine provides a sense of comfort and familiarity for kids. And that makes play an especially important tool for children when their environment changes. So my mom was divorced early. You know, one day my father just wasn't there anymore. And then, you know, one day my mom was remarried and then we were moving and It was like, I didn't really have control over any of those situations. And I think that math was something that I could control. Like it was something that even if it was hard, right? Like a funny number, long number, I could always at the end figure out the answer. There was something about that repetitive and also like true concrete nature that I liked. Like it was math, right? It's methodical. You know, like if you divide this number, like, you know, two into four, it's always going to be two. Stephanie liked math because she knew that she could always find the answer. She just had to solve the problem one step at a time. And because of dance, Stephanie had a lot of practice learning steps. And I think part of my early enjoyment of dancing was being able to memorize something fast. And, you know, that sort of need to be able to control something and achieve it, right? Like know that there would be an unknown and I could solve it, right? The unknown is how do you do this dance? And then the solving it is I can do the steps in sequential order the way that they were taught to me. Stephanie kept dancing and she kept studying math. And when she was older, she found another passion, science. People think that science and dance are diametrically opposed foes. In non-Hamilton words, they're totally different, like North and South, Hot and Cold, Garfield and Mondays. But Stephanie saw things a little differently. It actually felt like I was like traveling on like a loop, like on a circle. Like for me, the things were one very much bled into the next and then back around again. And so I always pictured dance and science as originating from a single point, traveling away from each other, and then reconnecting again at the bottom. When Stephanie went to Rutgers University, she decided to follow all of her passions. Why do one magnificent thing when you could do two or even three? Math was an important part of my life for a really long time. So I double majored in college. I was a genetics and microbiome research major and a dance major. And one of my favorite subjects was like astrophysics and, and vector physics. And I think it was for the same reason, just because I just thought it was easy and not that it was easy is not the right word. Like it was difficult, but if you just like followed the steps, you could always get to the answer. But some people thought that Stephanie was taking a step in the wrong direction. Stephanie's heart told her to follow all of her passions, dance and astrophysics and microbiology and math. But Stephanie's teachers told her to pick one. My dean at the time, the dean of the dance department, would always say to me, like, you know, if you really want to make it, you can only dance. Like, you, if if you're really serious about dancing, it will be the only thing that you do. Stephanie didn't listen to her dean. She studied dance. And she worked in labs, studying cancer treatments. How cool is that? Stephanie even got accepted to medical school. But 
Luckily for Lin-Manuel Miranda, Stephanie decided to defer her med school for a year and pursue dance. And when she got her first Broadway gig, she realized that the dean of the dance department couldn't have been more wrong. The sort of ironic thing of all of it is my first Broadway show I booked when I was 23, and I was made the swing of the show, which for my non-Broadway people, a swing is someone who covers multiple roles in the show. As a swing, you're oftentimes being put in a situation where like you're moving around 23 fast-moving bodies to music in front of a paying audience, and there's traffic patterns. That's science. It's science. Like memorizing traffic patterns is like organic chemistry. Like hands down, exact same thing. As a swing, Stephanie used science every day, and it swings both ways. And similarly speaking, when I'm in a lab thinking like, okay, what configurations can I add these materials together to create this outcome that I want? I have to be creative. I have to think, well, if I lessen this and I add a little bit more of this, and so there's large elements of creativity to that. You might think that Stephanie's story is pretty rare, but lots of artists have a science background, and lots of scientists have an art background. Brian May played guitar for Queen and then got a doctorate in astrophysics. Hedy Lamarr was a movie star whose inventions helped pave the way for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth headphones. And Beatrix Potter was a natural scientist who wrote and illustrated the tales of Peter Rabbit. All of these amazing people, just like Stephanie, knew that they could follow more than one passion. Because, you know, when you are one of these people that society considers to be an anomaly, it's like it turns out that we're not. So I think it's more common than you think, that sort of way of thinking of it as a loop as opposed to like a flat line. You know, not everything is linear and that a lot of people have that intersection of interest. And because she's just nonstop, Stephanie is still discovering new passions, like helping other people have access to art. I have a nonprofit organization called Katie's Art Project that connects kids facing life threatening and terminal illnesses with artists to basically create a lasting legacy through art. And that's not all. A few years ago, Stephanie found yet another passion parenthood. I am a mom of two little boys, a two and a half year old and a four month old. Stephanie shares her passions with her kids, even her four month old. After all, it's never too early to start learning rhythm. When I put him to sleep, I actually do like tapping rhythms on his tush. Um, And I did this with both my kids and I find the rhythm that calms them the most. Or I'll purposefully do like some polyrhythm or I'll purposefully do, you know, like some regular sort of like seven, eight rhythm. And with her two and a half year old, Stephanie does full on dance routines. We'll have like different dance parties. And, you know, we were on to Rock Lobster for a long time, which it's seven and a half minutes long and it's freaking exhausting. But we have like this whole sort of like choreographed thing that we do to these certain sections. And he loves that. Like he loves, you know, kids love to know when something's coming. Like they love to know the answer. And so that has been something that we've done as a family, which I think has really connected us and brings him a lot of joy. And by tapping out those rhythms and creating choreographed Rock Lobster routines, Stephanie is teaching her sons the basics of dance and the basics of math. I think oftentimes we forget that, like, you can teach science by having a dance party, right? Like, you can teach science and fractions by learning a piece of music. And you can teach, you know, the law of entropy by a dance class. I think that we'd find that a lot more people have, like, intersectional interest if we were to present things in, like, a slightly modified way. So parents, if your children have big dreams about being painters slash paleontologists, singers slash psychologists, or movie stars slash astronauts, let them explore those passions through play and as many passions as they can count. Remember, we can all be more than one magnificent thing. Once Upon a Playtime is a production of The Genius of Play made in partnership with Frequency Media. This podcast was made possible by a generous grant from the Toy Foundation. Visit thegeniusofplay.org for fun play ideas, resources, and expert advice. Follow us at Genius of Play on Facebook and Instagram for daily inspiration and tips. I'm your host, Jennifer Lynch. Michelle Corey is our executive producer. Our producers are Heidi Rudeboats and Jordan Rizzieri. 
Scripting by Isabel Moncloa Daly, Becca Godwin, and Jessica Olivier. Dialogue editing by Sydney Evans and sound design by Matthew Ernest Filler. This podcast is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and wherever podcasts are found.